Welcome to the, our third class in this series of classes about the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And today we're going to cover questions 232 to 324, which now begin to focus on the content of the creed. The first two classes we are really focusing on God's communicating himself to us, God's telling us about himself, and how we can respond to that, how we can accept that <clears throat> gift of God to us. Now we begin to look at the content of what he has told us both about himself and about ourselves. Okay, and so today, and we're following, as the Catechism does, uh, the Creed, through the Articles of the Creed, and we begin the first thing we profess in the Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator. Huh? The heaven and earth part will come on the next class, but uh, God, the Father Almighty, Creator. And in that revelation of God as Father, comes the revelation of the Trinity. So this is the place at which the Catechism delves into the faith that we have about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. And this doctrine about the Trinity, the Catechism points out to us, is at the very heart of our faith. I mean, I think for many of us, uh, the Trinity something we don't think about very often, perhaps. And I guess sometimes we might even view it as, gee, I wish God hadn't told us about that, you know? Uh, to say that there's a God, well, okay, that's, I, I, I kind of get that, that's not too hard. But now he, he has another ball I got to keep in the air, that there's only one God, but there are three persons who are God. And gosh, that seems awfully difficult to understand. And I kind of just as soon uh, not, not have heard about it. But that would be a terrible mistake, right? And the Catechism tells us that the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith. It is therefore the source of all the other mysteries of the faith, the light that enlightens them. Okay, so far from being something that uh, is very obscure and that we say, gosh, I don't, huh? I don't know that I really want to think very much about that. I may come out on the wrong side. Uh, it should throw light on all of our beliefs. Okay. And if we look at the history of salvation, the history of God's not only talking to us, but dealing with us, the Catechism tells us that that is identical with the way and the means by which the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, reveals himself to men and reconciles and unites with himself those who turn away from sin. Okay, so this is not some minor point of our Christian, our Catholic faith. Now, just a moment ago, I was saying that, you know, sometimes we may think that it's very obscure, and <laughs> wouldn't we be better off if we didn't know about it at all? Uh, but it, it is this light that enlightens our, all our other beliefs. But it is also true that it is difficult and in some sense obscure, because it's telling us about who God is in himself. And God is infinite. God is so far above us that, of course, we don't really fully grasp it. St. Jose Maria, founder of Opus Dei, uh, sometimes said that he liked to meditate on the Trinity, but he said, sometimes I get a little tiny spark of light. He said, and then I rejoice because, because I had a little, under, a little bit of understanding of the Trinity. But other times he said, not even that, not even a little spark. He said, but then he said, but then I rejoice because what kind of God would it be who could fit in my poor mind? Okay, so, so the Trinity, the heart of our faith. And the next uh, slide we have here, the next point from the Catechism, is in some sense uh, terminological, right? That if we 
look at the teaching of the fathers of the church. And who were the fathers of the church? The fathers of the church were early uh, teachers of the church mm -hmm. who are outstanding for both their doctrine and the holiness of their lives. Okay, so the doctors of the church are saints. Huh? All the doctors of the church are saints. And then some of them, the early ones, we call fathers of the church. And they're very important uh, because they tell us kind of what our first predecessors in the faith believed. Huh? What, what was the content of the faith? Okay. So the fathers often distinguished, as the catechism tells us, between theology and economy. Okay. Now, the theology part we don't have any trouble with, but economy seems like a very strange word to be using here. Uh, but in their vocabulary, theology referred to the mystery of God's inner life, the mystery of the life of the Trinity, whereas economy was the word they used to refer to the works by which God reveals himself and communicates his life. So creation, etc. all of that was part of the economy, okay? <clears throat> and the catechism tells us that through the economy, through what he does and that what we see him do to create and then to choose Israel and then to have the covenants with Israel, etc. That through all of that, the theology is revealed to us. We come to know who God <clears throat> is in himself. And conversely, knowing who God is and knowing about the Trinity and the three persons of the Trinity illuminates his actions, the economy. And that's the catechism tells us it's not surprising the same thing happens with us, right? That a person discloses himself in his actions and that the better we know a person, the better we understand his actions, okay? So we'll be seeing that throughout these upcoming uh, considerations, right? Okay, so we begin saying, I'm sorry, I got one, two, five, five, that God is Father. Okay, now I don't know what the slide is about. Uh, and that indicates two things, right? That God is the first origin of everything. And at the same time, that he's not just the force or some malevolent, huh? being, but he is goodness and loving care for his children. Okay. Could we Sir. do something about that, Brian? So, and the catechism tells us that that parental aspect of God, his parental tenderness, can also be expressed by the image of motherhood, which would emphasize God's imminence, because, after all, God transcends both human fatherhood and motherhood. God is neither male nor female. Uh -huh. uh, he is the origin of human fatherhood and motherhood, uh, but he is above all of that, okay, and certainly above the sexual differentiation, okay. But, uh, and all of that was common to many other pre-Christian religions. Huh? Belief is God is Father. Uh, but we see God as Father in a, another and much deeper sense, that Jesus revealed that he is Father not only by being the Creator, but he is eternally Father by his relationship to his Son. Okay, and if you are listening to the meditation this morning with Father Bob, you got some insight into that of how the Father and the Son uh, are in some sense defined by their relationship to each other. The Father is Father because he is Father of the Son. Huh? Even if he had never created, huh? never 
done anything with us and in our world, he would be father simply because he is the father of the son. And reciprocally, the son is son because of his relationship to the father. In the catechism quotes from the gospels, no one knows the son except the father, and no one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. So we have God as father, both in this aspect of being the creator, the source of everything, including our own lives, but also, and even more importantly, father, because he is father of God, the son. Uh, let me just add, I meant to say this at the beginning. Um, if you have a question at any point, you can either type it in, or just, if you prefer to talk, just type in, say, I have a question, and then we will unmute you, and you can, you can ask your question. Of course, we'll also have time for questions at the end, but as we go along, it's probably good to clarify things if they're not clear. Okay, so there is a father, and as we just said, he is father above all because he is father of the son. Huh? And who is this son? Well, the son is also God. He is the words of the Council of Nicaea in 325, consubstantial with the father. He has the same substance as the father. Okay, in that first ecumenical council of Nicaea, uh, which I seem to have misspelled up there on the slide, uh, confessed that the son is consubstantial with the father. And it did that because there was a terribly important and virulent heresy at the time, Arianism, which was saying that Christ was oh, the greatest thing after God, huh? above every creature, etc., but not really God. Okay. And the Council of Nicaea responded and said, no, he is consubstantial with the Father. I might just add that much of the doctrine of the Trinity and much of the doctrine about who Christ is came about in this way of someone, a heretic, huh? uh, so overstressing one aspect of Christian truth that he ended up denying another aspect. So Arius stressed so heavily that there's only one God huh, that he ended up denying that Christ was God. And then the church reflected and said, is that what we received from the apostles? Is that what Peter and John and James believed? That Christ was some marvelous person, but not God? And the church said, no, that's not, that's not what, what we believe. That's not what the tradition has passed on to us in the scriptures. And then it adopted this more or less technical term, huh? consubstantial with the father, huh? to sharpen and define what it was that Christians had believed for centuries before. And that same process will be repeated again and again huh? uh, as the church meditates on often on its belief often in response to a heresy. And a heresy isn't just something that's false. It, it's usually a truth that has been so heavily stressed and exaggerated that another truth has been lost sight of. But anyway, getting back to the main subject. So the father is, pardon me, the son is really God. He is consubstantial with the father. But then there is also the Holy Spirit, okay? So before his Passover, before passion and resurrection, our Lord told the apostles that he would send another paraclete or advocate. Huh? Uh, and this advocate has been at work since creation, having spoken through the prophets, but he will now be with the disciples to teach them, to guide them into all truth. And the catechism says that this reveals 
that this advocate, this spirit of God, because we had heard about a spirit of God before we had heard about a spirit even in, right in Genesis, in the account of creation, right? We were told that the spirit of God hovered over the waters. But probably people reading that before Christ would have simply said, well, that means that God is present. Huh? Okay. They wouldn't have thought that there was another person in God, but this revelation of the advocate who will be with you, uh, who is sent to the church, reveals this spirit of God as another divine person with Jesus and the Father. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this sending of the person of the spirit after Christ's glorification reveals the final piece, if you like, of the mystery of the Trinity. And here we, we see a little bit what we saw a couple of minutes ago of how the economy, in this case, the sending of the spirit, uh -huh. reveals the theology, reveals who God is. Okay. Good. So during these first centuries, first Christian centuries, particularly about the first five 500 years, 600 years, up to about the year 600, the church reflected a great deal on this doctrine of the Trinity. It's interesting to note that uh, the early councils up through about the year 600 focus, I think you can say, exclusively on two questions. Who is God and what is he like? And who is Jesus and what is he like? So they don't, the, the councils are not talking about morality or huh, our behavior or anything like that. They're talking about what is it that we believe? What is it that God has told us about himself? Uh, and so the church is reflecting on this and that is partly to defend it against errors and that also leads to a deepening of understanding, okay? So the very early Christians, the very early ones would have understood that there were, that there was one God and yet somehow there were, there was a father, a son, and a Holy Spirit. Uh, but they wouldn't have been able to formulate it in any precise terms beyond that, okay? But the councils and the fathers of the church sustained, as the catechism says, by the Christian people's sense of faith, gradually clarify that understanding and deepen it, okay? And to do that, the church adopts certain philosophical terms, concretely three, substance, huh? person, sometimes we use the Greek term hypostasis, and relation, okay? So the, the term substance, essence, nature, what a thing is, okay? So this is a table, huh? okay? And I am a human being, etc. okay? So what is, what is this thing? thing we're talking about. What is its nature, its substance, its essence? Okay, the church comes to understand that, that there is this unity of substance in God, huh? that there is, in that sense, only one God. There is only one divine substance. Huh? Okay, but the church uses the term person hypostasis, who acts? Okay, so who is teaching this class? Well, I am, John Coverdale, okay. Uh, who is listening to the class? Well, Tom Ansome is, okay, as well as some other people. Uh, so who is carrying out the action? Huh? Who is, and that can be, uh, just an individual, so if it's um, 
what dog is barking? Huh? Well, that's Blackie. Huh? Okay, we say that's an individual. His substance, his nature is to be a dog, but he's not just dogness, he's Blackie, and he's the one who acts. He's the one who barks and wags his tail. And when we talk about a, a, a human being, a rational being, we use the term person huh? to describe it. Okay. And again, if you were in the meditation this morning, uh, Father Bob was stressing that characteristic of persons huh, is their fact that they possess themselves and can give themselves to another. Okay. Uh, and the term, the third term the church used was relation to designate as the catechism says, the fact that the distinction in the persons lies in their relationship of each to the other. Okay, well, what makes the son, son is his relationship to the father, and what makes the father, father is his relationship to the son. And both of them are also designated by their relationship with the Holy Spirit, the act of love. Okay. John? Yeah. John DeFabio, um, quick question uh, about the person. Yeah. Uh, originally, when you were talking about that, I was saying, okay, that's Jesus. But if we're called to be ipse Christus, does that mean it's us too? Or is this really just about God, Jesus, and the relationship with the Holy Spirit? Um, so uh, each of us is, of course, a person. Huh? You are Don DeFabio, and I'm John Coverdale, okay? And Christ, Jesus, is another person. We'll see in a later class that Jesus is a, a divine person, okay? He is not a, there's not a human personality there, not personality taken, not as we usually use the word to say he has a good personality or his personality is very upbeat or he's got a very serious personality. But in the sense of saying the being a person, huh? okay, being this self-possessing individual, okay, uh, that in that sense, in Jesus, there is only the person of the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the word. And not a human personality. Now, I think, I, I believe that to say that we are called to be not only like Christ, but to be Christ, ipse Christus, Saint Jose Maria like to say, I is, is to say that somehow in some mystical way, we are called to live Christ's life. But of course we don't literally become Christ. Christ is who he is, the infinite, divine person who is also human and we are who we are i don't know if that helps any but that's it's a difficult question huh? maybe we can come I'm back working on it thank you I maybe got we it. can come back to that at the end of the class <laughs> and see if you have a, a more refined question and i have a better answer <laughs> no that was that was good no i got it thank you okay good so uh, uh, i have a question okay What's that? There used to be, the way you're saying it, it sounds a little simplistic. It used to be a Protestant minister, the way he used to explain it, and this is how it sounds like you're explaining it, was that he would say the God family, like we're the family of people and you're a different person, I'm a different person, but we both have human nature. And he would, the way he explained it was that he would say that God has divine nature, and there's different persons in that nature, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is that what you're saying? Because I... Well, it is, and it isn't, and I think we'll get that on this next slide that I just brought up. Let, let me go into that, and then we can come back if, if you still want to delve into this deeper. Okay, so each of us is a different person. Huh? But there's also different human natures. You have your human nature 
and I have mine. Okay. That's not true in God. As the Catechism says, the divine persons do not share one divinity among themselves. So first of all, there are not three divine natures, huh? the divine nature of the Father, the divine nature of the Son, the divine nature of the Holy Spirit. If that were true, we would have to say there are three gods. We don't say that. We say there's only one God because there's only one divine nature. But it's not that they share it among themselves either, that the Father has a piece of the divine nature and the Son another piece and the Holy Spirit a third piece, but that each of them is fully and holy God, each of them. And how is that possible? I don't think we understand that very well. At least I don't. <laughs> Maybe other people do. But how, how can that be? I don't think we really fully come to understand that. But that's what the church professes. That is part of our faith, that there is only one divine nature. But each of the divine persons fully possesses that nature. So the quote that the uh, catechism here continues with says, the father is that which the son is, the son that which the father is, the father and the son that which the Holy Spirit is, that is by nature one God. Or as the fourth Lateran Council said, each of the persons is that supreme reality, the divine substance, essence, or nature. Okay. So in a human, it, it, I think it's a pretty good analogy to, in some ways to say that God is family. God is not a solitary being. Okay. But in a human family, each member of the family possesses his or her own human nature in God. In God, there is only one divine nature, and that divine nature is fully possessed by each of the three. Was that your question, Art? Yes. I, okay. This is this is more like what I thought. Okay. Good. Well, I, I'm glad of that. I'm glad you weren't thinking something heretical. No, no, that was the other guy that I heard him say. I've heard him say it. He's been. Oh, okay. All right, well, let's pray for that guy that he's straightened up. Yeah. Okay, so now the other aspect of this, another way that we could misunderstand this, right, would be to say, well, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that's three names that designate kind of different ways of being, huh? of the divine being that if we think of god as creating we think of him as father and we think of him as redeeming we think of him as son and we think of him as sanctifying we think of him as holy spirit we're saying no that the they are really three persons distinct from one another okay uh, this is a kind of strange translation that the catechism has here but uh, they quote, and I'm not quite sure where it's from. I didn't bother to look. Uh, he is not the Father who is the Son, nor is the Son he who is the Father, nor is the Holy Spirit he who is the Father or the Son. Okay. So the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are really distinct from each other. How in their relations of origin? Okay, so the Father generate the father is not generated or created or made the father doesn't come from anyone else the father simply is father because he eternally generates the son okay and their relationship to each other that the father is generating the son and the son is generated by the father defines who they are okay but they are really different persons now what I was just saying could also easily lead us to say, oh, well, but then the father must be more than the son, better than the son, before the son. So first he's got to exist himself, and then he generates the son and becomes father. And so the son is posterior to and inferior to the father. But that's not true either, because there is in God no before and after, okay? 
the Father simply is Father mm -hmm. uh, from all eternity. And everything the Father has, the divine nature, the Son also has. Okay. And their only distinction between them is this relationship between them. And the same is true of the Holy Spirit. Okay. In the uh, headquarters of Opus Dei in Rome, uh, there's a, in the crypt where there's a number of tombs, uh, there's a plaque on the wall. I think it's something that St. Josemaria saw somewhere in Germany and really liked and had reproduced there, more or less. And it's about the Trinity and it shows a triangle. Huh? And at the top apex of the triangle, it says Father, and then it says Son, and then it says Holy Spirit. And then in the middle, there's a circle and it has the word God. And from each of the three apexes of the triangle run a line that's, and on that line it says is. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And then the lines connecting them, huh? the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit says is not. <laughs> okay. So the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, etc. Okay. Maybe that kind of helps to to think about the Trinity, okay? But so we have just one God, one divine substance, but three persons who are really distinct from each other, okay? How are we doing so far? <laughs> Anybody want to ask a question? <clears throat> no questions, okay. You see that? Huh? Okay, put a thumbs up. Oh, somebody has a thumb up, you're saying? Oh, who is it? Oh, you do. Well, then we have to unmute you. <coughs> no, okay. No, it's just an emoticon. Okay. So, <coughs> a further clarification, we say that what the whole economy, that is to say, everything that God does that is not simply the Father generating the Son and the Son and the Father together, uh, uh, not generating, but what's the right word for that? Uh, spirating. Spirating the, the Holy Spirit. All the other things like creation, huh? etc., is the common work of the three divine persons. Catechism says, for as the Trinity has only one and the same nature, so too does it have only one and the same operation. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not three principles of creation, but one principle. However, each divine person can performs the common works according to his unique personal property, according to who he is. And, and it gives an example of that. It says, thus the church confesses following the New Testament, one God and Father from whom all things are, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things are, and one Holy Spirit in whom all things are. Okay. So uh, the acts, so the, the medieval theologians use the term the acts to the outside. Huh? The acts that are something other than just the internal relations of the three persons of the Trinity. And I say just as if those were uh, kind of negligible or unimportant. No, they're, they're really much more important than things like creation. But anything else is common to the three persons, but each in his own way, each in the way that is appropriate to him. Okay. And we tend to go even beyond that. And this is true also the language of the scripture, it's not simply our language, uh, to attribute certain acts, like we attribute creation to the Father, and we, creation, we attribute redemption to the Son, and we attribute sanctification to the Holy Spirit. But actually, all three persons are involved in each of these, each in his own particular way, okay? Good. 
And why does God act to the outside, right? Uh, we have a question. Oh, okay. Well, let's unmute Isaac and let him ask his question. Hi, hi, John. Hi, everyone. Hi, Isaac. So, one of the things that's interesting about that statement on the previous slide, um, go back to which I, which is is still rather obscure to me, is most of this is pretty obscure. <laughs> <laughs> But the use of those prepositions from, through, through and, and in. in. Yeah. What do they mean? I mean, the from. Uh, it's pretty <laughs> obscure to me, too, to be honest. <laughs> okay. <with you. laughs> I, I, I can't say that I really know. Huh? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, as I was reading it out loud to you, I was thinking the same thing. I said, boy, I'm not sure this helps <laughs> much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any other questions? No, we're okay. We'll keep on going. So we're kind of asking, why does God create anything? Okay, why, why, why did God... An important point is to say that God doesn't gain anything by creating. Huh? God isn't enriched or enhanced or anything by creating. So why does he do it? And the catechism tells us the ultimate end of the whole divine economy of the action to the outside, if you like, is the entry of God's creatures into the perfect unity of the Blessed Trinity. And even now we are called to be a dwelling for the most holy Trinity. And it quotes our Lord, if a man loves me, says the Lord, he will keep my word and my father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. So everything is being led back to God, okay. Then in the catechism, we say we believe in God, the Father Almighty, okay. And uh, that's to say that God is omnipotent, and that he can do everything. Huh? And Catechism tells us, reminds us that the Holy Spirit repeatedly confesses the universal power of God. He is called the Mighty One of Jacob, the Lord of hosts, the Strong and Mighty One. If God is almighty in heaven and on earth, it is because he made them. Nothing is impossible with God who disposes his works according to his will. He is the Lord of the universe whose order he established and which remains wholly subject to him and at his disposal. He is the master of history, governing hearts and events in keeping with his will. It is always in your power to show great strength and who can withstand the strength of your arm. Okay. So God is almighty. He can do everything. All right. Everything, St. Thomas would tell us everything that is possible. Okay. Because um, St. Thomas asked himself somewhere, can God make a square circle? And he says, no, of course not. That's a contradiction. That's against the essence of being. Huh? And God can do, can do everything, huh? but that doesn't include what is contradictory. Okay, God can't make a thing to be and not be at the same time and under the same respect. Okay. And I don't, I don't know if I said this in one of the two previous classes. I have said it many times over the years. But I, I think that's a wonderful example of the churches and Saint, concretely St. Thomas's confidence in human reason. Okay, so Thomas says to himself, you know, asks himself, can God make a square circle? He says, a square circle is a contradiction in terms. That can't be, huh? simply can't be. But he doesn't say, well, that's the way I think about things. Huh? He says, that's the way I think about things because that's the way things are. I, with my reason, however limited, I reach the kind of the laws of being, how the world, how things really are. And Thomas, who is very, very devout, <laughs> you know, great believer in God, but says, no, of course God can't make a square circle. Huh? That's ridiculous. Okay. 
So I, I say this because you know people sometimes say, well, you Catholics, you know, you got all this faith business. You don't really believe in reason. We believe in reason much more than most people. <laughs> okay. Most people say, oh, well, I, I, I can't really think about a square circle because, you know, that my mind doesn't work that way. But the church and St. Thomas uh, leading the church says, I can't think about it because it can't be. <laughs> it just is incompatible with the way being really is. Okay. All right, that's kind of a, di a diversion uh, or a digression. Sorry about that. Um, the next point that the catechism considers uh, is then the problem of evil. Okay, and this is a huge problem for believers. Okay, I, I guess if you're not a believer, you just say, uh, hey, you know, the world's a hard, tough place and uh, a lot of things go wrong and that's just the way it is. Tough. Okay. But we say, hey, there, everything that is comes from God. And God is omnipotent. We haven't said it, but he's also omniscient. He knows everything. Uh, he can do everything. Why is there evil in the world? Okay. Um, and the church offers us an explanation, but it, it's not any simple explanation, okay? The church finds in Christ crucified the explanation or the clues, at least, to the explanation of all of this. In the most mysterious way, God the Father has revealed his almighty power in the voluntary humiliation and resurrection of his Son, by which he conquered evil. Christ crucified is thus the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. It is in Christ's resurrection and exaltation that the Father has shown the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe and has shown that suffering and evil present there and now supreme degree in the crucifixion are somehow fit into God's overall plan and that he somehow or other draws good from them. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, again, this morning in the meditation, Father Bob was talking about this, this problem of, of evil and now kind of the problem of the coronavirus and you know, why are all these terrible things happening, of not only people dying, but so many people out of work with no way of supporting their families, um, you know, just a really very bad situation. And we don't, we don't as Christians claim that we really understand it fully, right? so that we can grasp it, but, uh, we say somehow or other God has this in his, in his plan and his providence. Okay. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. The catechism comes back to it later. Um, but then the catechism moves on to begin. We had said the father almighty. And now in the creed, we say the creator of heaven and earth. Okay. And again, the catechism, just as the catechism stressed earlier the importance of the doctrine of the Trinity huh, to our Catholic faith, huh, uh, it now also stresses as the belief in creation as being central to our understanding of everything. Catechesis on creation makes explicit the response of the Christian faith to the basic question that men of all times have asked themselves, where do we come from? Where are we going? What is our origin? What is our end? Where does everything that exists come from and where is it going? The two questions, the first about the origin and the second about the end or meaning are inseparable. 
They're decisive for the meaning and orientation of our life and actions. And what do we answer as Christians? That, that it all comes from God, right? That it's all from him. And that should really influence kind of how we see everything. I'd like to <clears throat> tell people about a, a little incident that I experienced many years ago. Uh, I was out hiking with a fellow who was a wonderful young man uh, at the time. Uh, kind of had it all together, super smart, uh, I mean, athletic, handsome, and also just a nice guy. I mean, didn't even seem to realize how gifted he was, how talented he was. And we were out hiking in the Shenandoah Mountains in the fall. And uh, it was a beautiful day and the sun, you know, kind of the late afternoon, the sun streaming through these colored leaves. Uh, and he turned to me and I don't think he was yanking my chain. I think this was uh, <laughs> genuine on his part. He said to me, John, isn't evolution wonderful? <laughs> And I said to him, no, Paul, I, I don't think of it that way. And I think I quoted to him Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, the earth is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It will come to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed, etc." Okay. Or maybe I, I, I quoted to him Hopkins' other poem, Glory be to God for dappled things, for things of couple color like a brinded cow, like rose mills all in stipple upon trout that swim. Okay. And that poem ends up say, everything that is spare, counter, original, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Okay. So we say, where are we, where do we come from? We come from God, from God's creation. And where are we going? We're going to God, okay? So we believe, and it's the kind of first truth revealed in scripture in creation, okay? In the beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And the scripture, the catechism tells us the three things are affirmed in these first words of scripture. The eternal God gave a beginning to all that exists outside of himself. Second, he alone is the creator. The verb create in Hebrew bara always has God for its subject. And finally, the totality of what exists expressed by the formula of the heavens and the earth depends on the one who gives it being. Okay, so everything comes from God. God is the creator of all things. Okay. And although we generally tend to attribute creation to God the Father, the Word and the Spirit are both involved. So St. John, at the beginning of his gospel, tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So the New Testament thereby reveals that God created everything by the eternal word, his beloved son. In him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And we also believe that the Holy Spirit was involved in creation because he is the giver of life, the creator spirit, the source of every good. <clears throat> and why did God create? To reveal his glory. Okay. The word world was made for the glory of God. St. Bonaventure explains that God created all things, not to increase his glory, but to show it forth and to communicate it. For God has no other reason for creating than his love and goodness. Okay, so he simply wants to share with us huh, and his other creatures huh, to share his goodness. Okay, to share his whatever, huh, all that Christ had. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> so God doesn't, I, I think I said this a few minutes ago, God doesn't gain anything by creating. Huh? It's not that <clears throat> he is better off for having created the universe than if he hadn't created it. But we are better off. Okay. And the um, medieval philosophers often said, you know, that good just of itself tends to communicate itself. Huh? You know, and we even experience that in, in our own lives, right? That if you see a really good movie, you want to share it with other people. You want to say, hey, I saw this movie last week and it was really good. Huh? It's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. It was Tom Hanks. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. So when we have something good, we, we tend to. We, it's just the nature of good that wants to be communicated. Okay? And God, who is the full goodness, wants to communicate his goodness to his creatures. And that's why he creates them. Okay. Now, I think that the phrase, though, that we say that God does it for his own glory which is true, but it, um, I think it gives it a kind of bad taste in the mouth. You say, well, this guy's just showing off. <laughs> uh, but the catechism says the glory of God consists in the realization of this manifestation and communication of his goodness. God made us to be his sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. Okay, so again, it's not that God gains something by creating, that he wants, he said, I want other people to admire huh? me, etc. Well, he does in a way, I mean, that is true, he does do that, but it's not for us, huh? I'm trying to, it's not for himself, it's not that he will be enriched and enhanced by, um, our recognizing his goodness, but rather that we will be enriched and enhanced. And he loves his creatures and wants to communicate himself to them. Okay. Part of that then is this other question of why, okay, why did God make everything? Okay. Uh, and the catechism says the universe created in and by the eternal word, the image of the invisible God is destined for and addressed to man, himself created in the image of God and called to a personal relationship with God. Okay, so our Christian view of the world is on the one hand very theocentric, centered on God, but it is also a very anthropocentric view. We do think that God made the world for us, okay? destined to and addressed to man, okay? And kind of, again, uh, really just by chance, because I didn't talk to Father Bob about what this class was going to be about, and he certainly didn't talk to me about what his meditation was going to be about. But again, in the meditation this morning, he was stressing this idea that only man, the only man is the only creature for which, pardon me, that God made for itself, okay? And all the other creatures huh, are made for us. A very nice way of expressing this, which uh, somewhere in St. Thomas, I'm not quite sure where, I don't remember. Um, but St. Thomas somewhere asks himself, why did God make the stars? And his answer, so that we might know them. Hmm? Isn't that wonderful? The stars, all this immense universe that is, of course, much bigger than St. Thomas ever imagined. Although even what he imagined was kind of ungraspable. I don't know if it makes much difference that it's billions of light years or only a, a few light years. But anyway, but this huge universe, all this, why did God make it? So that we might know it and thereby give glory to him. Okay. So a wonderful vision of God and of the world. And we're talking here about creation, why God made things. 
but he didn't make them just kind of, I made them and there they are. Okay, so if say you make a statue or a painting or whatever, anything, once you've made it, it just exists on its own. Huh? It doesn't, it depended on you for your making it, but once made, it doesn't depend on you anymore, okay? But God sustains everything in existence, okay? That he not only calls them into being, but he upholds and sustains them in being. So if God were to stop huh, sustaining us, we would simply cease to exist. It's not that we go poof and become smoke or something. We just, I mean, we can't even really imagine it, but we would just drop out of existence. I'd like to use the analogy of saying in that sense, we're not like a statue or a painting that once made just continues to exist. We're like, a, like an image thrown up on the TV screen. You know, and you turn off the power. It's not that it goes somewhere else. It just doesn't exist anymore. Well, our whole being is like that. God is maintaining us and everything else in existence. Okay. So we are utterly dependent on the creator, not only for coming to be, but for continuing to be. Okay. And God keeps us in existence and he also looks out for us. He governs the universe. So there was a, a movement in European thought in the 18th century uh, called deism, which said, yes, there's a God, but their God was this watchmaker God. He makes the watch, he winds it up, and then it just exists on its own. It just goes tick tock, tick tock on its own. Okay, uh, but that's not the Christian God. Uh, God guides things, okay? The universe was created in a state of journeying, as a way of being on its way toward an ultimate perfection yet to be attained, to which God has destined it. And we call divine providence the dispositions by which God guides his creation toward this perfection, okay? So God guides the world and the universe, okay? And he does so concretely and immediately, okay? So it's not just some big general plan that God has for things and then <clears throat> details he leaves to be worked out. But it says the witness of scripture unanimous that the solicitude of divine providence is concrete and immediate. God cares for all from the least things to the great events of the world and its history. You know, and our Lord tells us that, right? That the hairs of your head are all numbered and that God cares even for the sparrows, how much more for you, O oh, you of little faith. The sacred books powerfully affirm God's absolute sovereignty of the course of events. Our God is in the heavens. He does not, whatever he pleases. And so it is with Christ who opens and no one shall shut, who shuts and no one shall open. Okay. Uh, oops, I hit the wrong button there, sorry. There we go. But we also have a part in this. You know? We also are causes, real causes of what happens. God is the sovereign master of his plan, but to carry it out, he also makes use of his creatures' cooperation, not as a sign of weakness, but a token of almighty God's greatness and goodness. For God grants his creatures not only their existence, but also the dignity of acting on their own, of being causes and principles for each other, and thus of cooperating in the accomplishment of his plan. And some of, and we humans are free collaborators in God's plan, okay? The, and the church also really believes in our freedom, okay? Again, um, so many of our contemporaries, I think, don't really believe that we're free. You know, they say, well, we, 
you kind of think we're free. It's uh, the example is often you hear used, you know, it's like the snowball rolling down the hill that thinks that it <laughs> wants to roll down the hill, but it really doesn't have any choice. Okay. But the church believes that no, God really made us free. And we might ask ourselves, why? You know, why did he kind of run the risk of our freedom? Because if we're free, then we can misuse it, right? But the church says, yes, but if we weren't free, we couldn't love. God wants us to love him, to love each other. Uh, and we can only do that if we are free, okay? But that then kind of brings us back to where we were a few minutes ago, and which is so uh, relevant to the special times we're living in of this problem of evil. Okay, so why, <clears throat> why does God permit evil? No quick answer will suffice. And this, I think this is a very interesting point the Catechism makes, as only Christian faith as a whole constitutes the answer to this question. The goodness of creation, the drama of sin, the patient love of God who comes to meet man by his covenants, the redemptive incarnation, his gift of the spirit, his gathering of the church, the power of the sacraments, and his call to a blessed life to which free creatures are invited to consent in advance, but from which by a terrible mystery they can also turn away in advance. There is not a single aspect of the Christian message that is not in part an answer to the question of evil. So we don't have some kind of simple little formula. We have to understand it in terms of the whole of our Christian faith. Okay. And <clears throat> but part of that answer is this idea that God is able to draw good out of evil. Okay. St. Augustine says, for Almighty God, because he is supremely good, would never allow any evil whatsoever to exist in his works if he were not so all-powerful and good as to cause good to emerge from evil itself. Okay. And I put up, it's a title of this little slide, Omnia in Bonum, everything is for the good, right? Well, that's a kind of condensed version that St. Jose Maria liked to use as an aspiration, a short little prayer, omnium bonum, of a somewhat longer phrase of St. Paul, where he says, diligentibus deum omnia cooperanter in bonum, for those who love God, all things work together unto good. Okay. And we have here the catechism quotes a wonderful phrase from St. Thomas More writing to his daughter Meg shortly before his mar martyrdom. And he says, nothing can come but that that God wills. And I make me very sure, he means I, we would say I am very sure, that whatsoever that be, seem it never so bad in sight, it shall indeed be the best. Okay, now for this to make any sense to us, a very important thing is, is the, the kind of the hierarchy of goods, okay? So for Thomas More, they're about to be beheaded, huh? and that's a very bad thing. Right? For Thomas More, about to be beheaded, to be able to say huh, that it shall indeed be the best, it's because he believes that the love of God, the salvation of his soul, etc., is more important than life itself. Okay. St. Thomas expresses this somewhere, <clears throat> and he says something quite, I don't know, really almost shocking. He says, the least supernatural good is greater than the created, than the entire natural good of the created universe. Well, that takes a lot of faith to believe that, right? But if we believe that, then we can see, okay, that, and again, I keep coming back to Father Bob's meditation this morning because I think this is what he was getting at, of saying that out of these terrible circumstances and circumstances that we have to try to work to alleviate and we have to try to do what we can, you know, to keep 
are, are, are six feet and not spread the virus and and also to help people who are really suffering maybe people we know that you know they're hourly workers and they don't have any any pay okay they don't know how they're going to pay the bills well if we're in the position to do so to be able to, to to reach out to them and help them of course we should do all that but we're also saying that somehow God will draw good out of all of this and good perhaps not at the natural level, not maybe that the economy will come back stronger than it was before or something like that. Maybe there won't be much natural good to be found in the outcome of all of this, but that at least at the level of the supernatural good of the salvation of souls, et cetera, that God will somehow, uh, ways that we don't understand, make it work for the good right and uh, we you know and and i would kind of just end up on this note of saying that that we don't really understand okay but that's that's fine you know and saint saint paul somewhere or other also says you know oh man you know who are you to ask an account of god okay and say well god why does god allow this well we don't know uh -huh. And uh, we probably can't uh, really grasp it, but we can have this faith, huh? this quote that I have up on the screen right now from the Romans, for those who love God, all things work together unto good. And I think that's our last slide, other than to say that our next class will be May 2nd at 10 a.m. And if you want to read ahead, we'll be covering Catechism of the Catholic Church 325 to 421, uh, which deals with what God created and particularly doesn't really pay any particular attention to the plants and the animals and all that. It talks about the angels and men, huh? what our human understand, our understanding of what it is to be human, and then the topic of sin. Okay. So if people have questions, I'd be happy to try and field them at this point. And apparently all participants are now unmuted, so you can jump in. This might be a dumb question, but I wanted to ask. Um, why was the, um, they used the term Holy Spirit, now, but back then they used to use the Holy Ghost. Why was that changed? Oh, uh, I, I, I don't know, but I, I think it was just that they had the idea that the word ghost, which originally simply, you know, it's a, a German root word for spirit. Huh? Okay. Uh, there's no difference in the meaning, but I think they mm -hmm. probably just thought that, you know, the word ghost had become so firmly associated with white sheets and, uh, and foolish, to still foolishness use that, that it was better to drop that German root word and go to the Latin root word spirit that both expressed the same thing. Okay. And that's the Trident's team still use that. Okay. Well, I, you know, I don't think there's any difference in content. Okay. It's just that, okay. the, you know, if, if you said to <clears throat> almost anybody these days, you know, the Holy Ghost, what's that mean to you? And say, well, I don't know. I mean, I know what a ghost is, what a Holy Ghost is. I'm not so sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's it. Huh? <laughs> any other questions? John, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Mike McKiernan, thank you. Outstanding work. When you and I don't know if we have enough time to get into this now, but when you talked about St. Thomas Aquinas and the example of a square into right. a circle, and that it's not it's not rational or God can't contradict the laws of nature He put in place, but is that very statement limiting uh, putting God into a box, if you will? Like why? Could you yeah, maybe help well, me first, understand that a little bit? Okay. Well, first of all, no. I first of all, I would start with. Um, I mean, it's kind of complicated, but I'd start with uh, taking exception to to saying the laws of nature, because God can act outside the normal physical processes, and the miracles are. Examples of that are Lord turning water into wine. Okay. What Thomas says that God can't do is contradict the laws of being. Huh? 
And in the sense that I think Peter Bob wouldn't like this very much because he's a God is not a being. Huh? Yeah. Well, he's not a being in the exact same sense that you and I are. But yes, God is the fullness of being. And so what Thomas is saying, I think, or what he's seeing is that what we are able to know from our knowledge of the things around us about what it is to be, to be, huh? what a being is, reflects something about who God is, okay? And so to act against the, the laws of being, it would be for God to be acting against his very nature, okay? So these aren't just, in Thomas's view, these conclusions that we reach about being and concretely our conclusion that a thing cannot be and not be at the same time and in the same respect, law of non-contradiction, applies to God as well. And it, and it applies to the beings around us in a sense, because that's what being really is all about, including God, okay? So, but that's very different from saying that God uh, can't violate the laws of nature. The laws of nature are regularities that God has imposed on the physical universe, uh, and God rarely does, but can huh, change those things. Okay, does that help any? Not much, <laughs> he says. John, can I? Uh... Can I put my two cents in here? When I was about, I'm really going to say the same thing you just said, but in a more simplistic way. When okay. I was 10, I asked my father this exact same question. And this is how he explained it to me, and it's stuck with me ever since. He, he had his and that's been a while. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he held out his two hands. For both of us. <laughs> and Go ahead, hand, Art. Sorry. Okay. In one hand, he had a pencil, and in one hand, he had nothing. And he had his hands closed, and then he opened the one hand with a pencil, and he said to me, what do I have in this hand? I said, a pencil. He opened his other hand, and he said, what do I have in this hand? And I said, nothing. And he said, that's it. God can do anything, but he can't do any nothing. Okay, well, that's, so it's that's the same kind thing of thing. Just said, but it's in a 10-year-old explanation. Okay, well, that's pretty good. Raphael D. Roman had a question. Okay. Hey, John. Let, let me get really basic here. Um, you know, if God didn't exist, yeah. or if he was a malevolent being that created just us just to toy with, uh -huh. but we creatures could not accept that. And we wanted to wish that he existed. The, it seems to me, it seems to me that the arguments that, that we would the arguments conjure, that we would conjure would be very similar to what we talked about here today. Very elaborate descriptions very elaborate of what descriptions is good and benevolent and, and how there are manifestations of it. But everything that contradicts it capacity to understand. You follow what I'm saying? This is the stumbling block that, that I find wherever I find wherever I speak to somebody who is not a somebody who is not a believer. And in yeah. with that, um, yeah. yeah. with that um, yeah. talking, oh, talking oh, about oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom oh, of the description I, of why the, 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 the understanding of evil has to do with the fact that you're free. Smell. 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 Okay, well, I'm not, uh, well, I'm not, uh, I'm having a lot of trouble hearing this. You're getting a remarkable echo. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that what you say is not. John, you're muted. I, I can't hear John. You, uh, sorry. Okay, you're on. Okay, so I was saying, um, I'm not sure that I have uh, some killer argument to say, no, you're wrong. Huh? Um, 
And I think that is more or less plausible. Um, and we don't have, you know, a, a, how should I put it? We don't, the, the church does say that we can know by natural reason that God exists, that he is good, etc. cetera, okay? Um, but we don't know it, and the church says this. The church says that, well, then why does God bother to reveal these things? Well, because our knowledge, our purely natural knowledge of them is uh, limited and somewhat obscure, uh, difficult, etc. And we could easily reach wrong conclusions, okay? So on the one hand, um, we, we say that we know these, well, first of all, we, we know these things by faith, but that we can also know them by natural reason. But that's not to say that there aren't uh, more or less convincing arguments on the other side, okay? So I think I said in uh, either the first or the second class that, uh, you know, like St. Thomas never talks about his having proofs for the existence of God. He says there's five ways in which we can come to know the existence of God, but he's not saying that they're kind of killer proofs. Uh, and so your um, non-believer who says these things, you know, probably isn't going to be, you're probably not going to find some argument that you can kind of just tell him no, and he's going to say, oh, okay, you got me. <laughs> I'm convinced. Um, so I guess I'm saying <clears throat> yes and no. Uh, they're not bad uh, arguments on the other side. Uh, they're not correct, but uh, but they're not bad arguments. We have a question from the dog. Oh, from Isaac. What's up? Now we're gonna. There, you've been. My dog unmuted wants us. to know. My dog wants to know if she'll go to heaven. No. <laughs> no, but she may be present in, with you in heaven somehow. There you go. <laughs> okay. If if that, although you know, I don't think I don't think some some people would say the opposite. I guess I don't think that you would miss your dog in heaven. Huh? Say, hey, I'm not, huh? I'm not happy without my dog. <laughs> I think if you have God, that's uh, huh? probably all you need. Huh? I would think so. Certainly, your dog will not have the beatific vision. Your God will, not, your dog will not see God face to face. Sorry about that. However fine a dog it may be, and what is the dog's name? He has a Chinese name. Oh. Xi Wang. Xi okay. for short. Okay. <laughs> anyway, sorry, folks. Now, I've never met a dog with a name like that before. <laughs> <laughs> and does the dog speak Chinese? Yes, actually. Okay, no, that's pretty good. <laughs> Did you see that Marco has a question? No, I didn't, but okay. He, uh, po he posted it there. Did God know, uh, did he know that he would eat the fruit? Yes, he knew. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he foreordained it to happen. Okay. Um, so, you know, I was saying earlier that the church is convinced that we really are free. Okay. And Adam and Eve really were free. And God's knowing that something will happen doesn't take away. He, he knows that it will happen freely. Okay. He knows that they, and, and it's not just Adam and Eve, it's about us too. And it's not just about bad things we do. It's also about the good things that we do. Okay. Uh, God knows that, you know, you will say something kind to your wife this afternoon. Okay. And that's a, a good thing, a meritorious thing you're doing. And the fact that God knows you're going to do it doesn't 
mean that you don't choose to do it and doesn't mean that uh, therefore it doesn't have merit, okay? And, and the, the whole issue of freedom is a very difficult one, okay, to really understand. And, and I think it, at the end of the day, we, we don't really fully understand how we can be created creatures huh? and still be really free. But we do, I think, first experience it. Huh? You know, we experience that we're free. So um, I'm sure this doesn't happen, but let's say that you quarrel with your wife. Hmm? And a little later you say to yourself, I should apologize. But then you just have to, damn it, I don't want to apologize. I apologized the last three times. It's her turn to apologize. And you know that you should apologize. And you know that you could apologize. And you know that it would be better if you did apologize. But I just don't want to. Okay. And so I think we, we experience our freedom. Now, when we try to in theory about it, it beca all becomes much more complicated. That's kind of a long answer to your question. It's a little like Frodo at the end of the Lord of the Rings, right? Oops. It's a little like Frodo at the end of the Lord of the Rings, where he's That's right. the ring all this way, and he says, I have come here, and, but I choose not to do what I right. came here for. Yeah. That's right. And one of the terrible things about the movie of The Lord of the Rings is they cut that out. It's maybe the best line in the whole book, right? For this I have come, but I do not choose to do it. <laughs> yeah. Good old Frodo. Okay, so are we done with questions? Well, let's let's play with that, John. So where do we go with that? Here's Don DeFabio. So because we run into that every day, you know, yeah. the Holy Spirit knocks on our shoulder and says, OK, say something yeah. nice to your wife. And you go. <laughs> so yeah, well, where do we go with that. Well, where do we go? Well, we have to uh, try to pray, to ask for God's help, but also make more effort to, <laughs> to do what we what we should do, right? And especially these days, okay, <laughs> to try to smile. Sometimes we don't feel like it. But yeah, I, I'm not sure what you're asking, Don, to be honest with you. Pardon? I'm not sure what you were trying, what you were getting at there. Well, what I'm getting at, well, that, that's just it because, you know, try is trying, doing is doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and it's it's to start again is the concept, right? Uh -huh. Every day to start again, to start again, and and it's such a simple concept, but to own it is so difficult. Well, it's difficult, no doubt. <laughs> so just keep reminding yourself to start again. Then I guess that's it. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's it. Keep it simple. Thank okay. you. Great job. So are we done here? Oh, it's 1125 already. My goodness. Wow. I, I guess I, just one point that you, you had asked, Don, are we judged on the effort that we make toward movement, toward the divine and actions to love our neighbors and be more Christ-like? I think yes, um, but uh, but I would say that uh, one little kind of clarification is that it's it's the effort we make, but it's above all the effort we make to be open to God's grace and inspiration, etc. So it's not just grit our teeth and huh, make more effort. Huh? but it's an, uh, an effort to open ourselves to God's inspiration and his grace and what he wants of us, okay? It's a, 
in some ways a small difference, but not so small. Well, we probably ought to close this, I think.